Greetings. Welcome, or I should say thank you for welcoming me into your places. And I'm very grateful for that. Here in central Alberta, Canada, we are celebrating a long weekend. It's called Victoria Day weekend. And um, so it's been great. This is usually in this area of, of Canada where many people will, will begin their uh, holiday seasons in the form of camping, going to lakes and stuff like that. And that's always a bit of a, a risk because here in Alberta we can, as many of you can attest, we uh, may get snow on a Victoria Day weekend. Anyways, I, before we get into the meat and potatoes of things today, I just wanted to say to whoever's listening to this, whoever's watching this, if you're not from, uh, you know, Redwater Alliance Church, uh, thank you for listening. Uh, but I will also want to encourage you to, um, to reach out if you have any questions and comments. Uh, these messages are on Facebook and you'll find it on our YouTube channel, Redwater Alliance YouTube channel. But certainly most of the productivity of these messages is found on Facebook. Um, you can connect with us via Messenger through Facebook. Um, Basically, if you have a question or you have anything you want, you might want to say, just go to, just leave a message and uh, it will be responded to as quickly as possible. Kind of just have a little bit of a conversation. Um, you know, we've been going through uh, 1 Timothy for a number of uh, weeks now, quite a few weeks, um, months, a couple of months or more. And uh, maybe you have a question, maybe you have, you wonder, uh, maybe you have a question for me and I would love to engage with you on that platform. Uh, having said that, uh, I do want to start by talking about the WWW, the World Wide Web, as I already mentioned, uh, an application called Messenger. And because of the World Wide Web, the internet, uh, we can have these kind of things. And when the World Wide Web uh, became a thing, it has changed basically the way we communicate forever. And uh, thinking of social media, it has become without a doubt a major influencer and motivator in the public square, in homes, families, in business and religious circles, education, pretty well every area of our culture. And like many things in, uh, in life, the internet itself is simply a tool. It is amoral, it's neither good nor bad. And really, at its very basic level, it is a digital platform for communication. And within that platform, you'll find the, you know, the theory of electricity. You find the zeros and ones of computer language, algorithms, platforms, cache, codes, passwords, on and on and on. But as we think about it, truth be told, there's more here in the World Wide Web than electrons and codes. And I found an interesting article I want to share with you. And it's called this, Three Ways Social Media Endangers a Christian's Life. And I just want to highlight uh, one of those ways it suggests. And it's worth highlighting because the article calls this the most dangerous effect of all. According to this article, social media is a breeding, a perfect breeding ground of secret sin. And if we think about this, it happens when we use social media in a sinful way, hurtful way. And we hide it. And the social media platforms through the internet, uh, we can uh, remain anonymous, can't we? We can portray ourselves as someone else and say the things that we do. Another person by the name of Greg Morris in his article titled, Thou Shalt Not Slander, speaking about the online world from another angle, said this. This online world is populated with more than a few who disregard one of God's most basic and most serious commandments. Now, if you're listening to this, watching this, and you're not sure what that is, um, let me just remind us all that this is the ninth commandment we find in the 20th chapter of the book of Exodus. And it goes like this, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Keep this as sort of the foundation of the message today. And he goes on, Morris goes on to explain how it works, at least from his perspective online. Quote, in the online world, accusation often equals conviction. One person can be offended, embittered, or claim victim status <clears throat> and skip judicial courts 
or church governance, governance, and bring it instead into the, and bring it, pardon me, instead before the courts of public opinion. He needs no second, no evidence. The alleged perpetrated uh, speaks, and his word is increasingly not challenged or cross-examined. End quote. The Apostle Paul, in the letter that we're looking at, 1 Timothy, writing to Timothy, said this to Timothy and by extension to the church in Ephesus and to us today. Do not entertain an accusation against an elder unless it is brought by two or three witnesses. So please turn in your Bible, your Bible app, however, whatever way you have access to this, the Bible, to the fifth chapter of 1 Timothy, and we're going to finish this chapter off uh, today, and we're going to start in verse 17 to the end. So 1 Timothy chapter 5, beginning in verse 17. The elders who direct the affairs of the church well are worthy of double honor, especially those who work, whose work is preaching and teaching. For scripture says, do not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain, and the worker deserves his wages. Do not entertain an accusation against an elder unless it is brought by two or three witnesses. But those elders who are sinning, you are to reprove before everyone, so that, the, uh, so that others may take warning. I charge you in the sight of God and Christ Jesus and the elect angels to keep these instructions without partiality and do nothing out of favoritism. Verse 22. Do not be hasty in the laying on of hands and do not share in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. Stop drinking only water and use a little wine because of your stomach and your frequent illnesses. Verse 23, stop, uh, verse 24, pardon me. The sins of some are obvious, reaching the place of judgment against them. The sins of others trail behind them. In the same way, good deeds are obvious, and even those that are not obvious cannot remain hidden forever. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let us pray together. Oh Lord God, we thank you. As we look at the second half of this chapter in 1 Timothy, and uh, we just ask, oh, Holy Spirit, that you help us understand it and to put it into practice in our lives and move, move it into action, not just some, uh, some idea. And Lord, I pray that uh, you would be glorified in all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So the Apostle Paul um, now returns in chapter 5 to the subject of leadership in the Ephesian church. The first half of chapter four, 5, he's talking about the social responsibility of the church before God for those in, in need, uh, the, the marginalized, and, and, and those kind of folks. But also, as you will see here, for the responsibility of church to, uh, to uh, give fair compensation to their leaders, their spare, to their elders and pastors. Same thing, elders, pastors. And Paul has already said a number of things, if, if you go back to chapter 1, uh, about the church in Ephesus. He said that some had taught false doctrines in the church there, and as a result, devoted themselves to myths and endless genealogies, which, according to Paul, only promoted controversial speculations rather than advancing God's work, which is by faith. You'll find that in the introductory comments in chapter 1. And so, folks, from chapter 1 through to the end of chapter 4, Paul instructed Paul, Pastor Timothy in reestablishing godly worship in the church at Ephesus. Two, in a way, as we could say in our own uh, uh, parlance today, uh, hit the default button. Go back to the basics. Another way we can say this is to sort of say it this way, uh, Timothy, as the elder pastor, same thing, of the church, get back to the gospel of Jesus Christ alone. Don't add anything to it. God has shown you through the scriptures how the body of Christ is to worship a holy and just God. Remember the ordinances, holy communion and baptism, how men and women are to interact with each other in the community of faith. Who has the responsibility, according to God's design and order and his holy Bible, to lead spiritually and teach and preach from the word of God. 
How, where, when, why the church is socially responsible to be the hands and feet of, of its Lord and, and Savior, Jesus Christ, when it comes to the needy, the destitute, the marginalized, not only for the needs of the church, but in the community as well. And as we look at our text for today, friends, uh, Paul instructs Timothy, the church, and by extension, us, the church today, concerning those who lead us in truth and godliness. And just in case, though, we think that the focus is only on the leaders or the leadership, we find in these verses the responsibility of the church as a whole uh, in showing respect and honor to those God has called to lead the local church. And how the church in dealing with their leaders and, 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 and also just with all the members must do so with impartiality, fairness, and appropriate discipline when required. So as we look at this text, we also have to keep some things in mind. Remember the, the rule, the basic rule of thumb is context, context, context. We keep in mind that from the middle of chapter 2 through to about the 12th verse of chapter 3, we keep that in mind. Now, I'm not going to rehash that. If you have your Bible there, you can take a quick peek or study it later. So with this in mind, we turn to the first two verses, 17 and 18. Here, Paul addressing the responsibility of the church and its leadership toward the elders and pastors, the leaders of the church. Notice that Paul has a qualification for those who direct the affairs of the church. If the ones that are directing the affairs of the church in verse 17 here do so well, these elders, Paul said, are, to, are worthy of double honor. That's how he puts it. So what did Paul mean by double honor? Well, I just want to keep this the short and the skinny, keep it easy, keep it simple, I mean. Uh, it does not mean that the elder of the church, the pastor of the church, is received from the church twice the wage as anyone else. It certainly doesn't mean that. And without the time to go through all the passages concerning this, it does mean biblically that those who direct the affairs of the church well, that's the, the qualifications, they, they are worthy of a fair pay, fair compensation, and the respect of the members of the church. And just in case we start to think that this is Paul's opinion, which I'm sure we're not, but just in case, we find here in verse 18 that Paul cites two biblical precedents for his reasons to provide a fair wage for those who labor and work in the leading, preaching, and teaching of God's holy word. We have one that he quotes from uh, Deuteronomy chapter 25, 4, from the law, that which given to Moses, given to Israel, and the other from Jesus' own teaching in the Gospel of Luke chapter 10, verse 7. And here's the point about all this. Paul here in this letter is consistently throughout supporting his instructions from God's created order and from God's word. Moving into 19 to 22, we're going to be doing, spending a little more time here. So just keep that in mind. Um, but anyways, what we have here, the way I like to present this to you, suggest it to you, is we have from 19 to 22 a double-edged sword. And Frank, you know, we know that a double-edged sword can cut on both sides. And here's my point. While these verses deal specifically and directly with the elders in Ephesus and by extension the elders in the church today, the application here in this text is for all of us, for you and for me, for the followers of Jesus Christ and every local church in the world. Let's go back to Greg Morris, who I quoted, the second fellow I quoted. quoted. I think that's a good starting point as we begin our discussion here, our study here of this particular set of text. He said, online justice rarely sticks around to see how things end. And those who uh, bear false witness against their neighbors on social media are rarely held accountable. Now, I, I think we all recognize that to be true. So, but, but what did the Apostle Paul say to the church in Ephesus regarding elders? Well, first he said this. I'll repeat it because I said it before. Do not entertain an accusation against an elder unless it's brought by two or three witnesses. Now, as we begin to unpack this, we need to remember to put on our 
biblical thinking caps. You know, we don't set our minds to the side. We put our thinking caps on biblically, and we take a look at an Old Testament reference to begin with, a couple of them actually, as I mentioned last week. And we're going to go to the Ten Commandments, which are located in Exodus chapter 20. And we're going to go to the 16th verse. And there, the ninth uh, commandment says this, You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. And in chapter 21, 22, and 23, that follow uh, in this particular set of commandments... We have the working out of those commandments in the details of the social responsibility, religious life, cultural life of the nation of Israel. And the law, which addresses justice and mercy, really reveal the heart of God. And we see an example of that in the 23rd chapter, verse 1, where we have this phrase, do not spread false reports. Let's go to another book in the Old Testament, the book of Leviticus, for some additional commentary. In Leviticus, as a whole, you will find from beginning to end this phrase repeated over and over. The Lord said to Moses. And Leviticus 19 itself starts with the same phrase. So what did God what did the Lord say to Moses in verse 12 of Leviticus 19? Well, he said this, Do not swear falsely by my name, and so profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. We go to another book now to add more commentary to try and understand this better. We go to Deuteronomy chapter 19 and verse 15, and there we read, one witness is not enough to convict anyone accused of any crime or offense, or offense they may have committed. A matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. That's Deuteronomy 19.15. Um, so what we have here, as we add this all up, if you will, call it that, we have the ninth commandment fleshed out into the life of the people of God, Israel, at the time. And so we, we, we can say with relative assurance that Deuteronomy chapter 19 and 15 and Matthew's Gospel chapter 18, 15 to 20, which I'm not going to read, you should take that down, check, check it out, form the basis for Paul's instructions to Timothy here in our text in this letter. The basis by which the local church like the church that I belong to, and all local churches will deal with their elders and leaders and the community all together. Let me ask you a question, as we're still kind of sitting in the Old Testament era. Have you ever wondered what happened um, to someone who would have given a false testimony back in the day, in the Old Testament days of Israel? We go back to Deuteronomy 19, the very next verse after 15, and we have this sentence or this comment. If a malicious witness takes a stand to accuse someone of a crime, if, and then it's going to explain what the process is, if a malicious witness takes the stand. Well, they would be brought before the Lord, the priests, and, and, and the judge, and remember, Israel was a theocracy, not a Democracy. So the, the judges of Israel were the priests and leaders, spiritual leaders. And the judge would carry out what the text tells us, if we were to read it, a thorough investigation. Okay, they would bring all the facts in. Not innuendo, not rumors, not, you know, this person said that, this person said this. They would bring in all the facts and examine them. And if the witness was found to be a liar who gave false testimony, they would do to the false witness what was intended to the other party. So remember, now this is not always about stoning someone. There would be all sorts of things that a person could be accused of, theft or bribery or whatever. All those things that we even have today. They would do to the false witness what was intended to the other party, to the, also the, the penalty of death. 
If they falsely accuse someone that was being convicted of a serious crime, like murdering someone, which the penalty of the, uh, of the day was death, and they, they were found to be false witnesses, falsely accusing, and they went through all the evidence, and yes, you, are, you, you were falsely accused this person, they would do to you what was intended to the other party. Now, King Solomon, the son of King David, who was endowed for, uh, with wisdom from God, said this about false witnesses. A false witness will not go unpunished, and whoever pours out lies will perish. Jesus said this, we're going to add all these up here, folks. From out of the heart come evil thoughts. And then he gives a list. Murder, adultery, sexual morality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what defile a person. And just want to add one more to you, the letter that James wrote in the New Testament. And he said, brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them, speaks against the law and judges it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who's able to save and destroy. So let's put this all together. Uh, you know, we're still dealing with 19, uh, 19 and 20, uh, 19 actually, quite frankly. But let's put this all together practically when we deal with pastors or elders and to any believer in a church. And this is how it works. Before anyone brings an accusation, a charge forward, Said person must do so with two or three witnesses. And these witnesses that ag must agree that the accusation, this charge that's being fought for, is based on fact, not rumor, not hearsay. And by the way, this is just the first step. The next step in the church today and in Timothy's day, the evidence in the charge must be weighed by the court. And like Israel, the court of the day is the leadership, the spiritual leadership of that local church. Keeping in mind all the biblical constructions that we already talked to or referred to. So, Deuteronomy 19, 15, Matthew 18. In verse 20, we see that Paul is very clear when it comes to the elders who are sinning. That is, a charge has been found to stand, and they are guilty. Well, these elders, Paul would say, are to be brought before the assembly, the church. Because of their calling and responsibility, they're to be reproved before everyone so that others may take warning. And you might ask, what about those believers who are not elders and pastors? When they are found that their charge stands against them, you apply exactly what we are instructed in Matthew 18, verse 15 through 20. Friends, but here's the bottom line with all this. The local church is where you'll find the provisions... God has provided all the needs of the local body for those in need and for the leaders. That's where you'll find all that is needed. God has provided for all that's within the local body of Christ. And God has provided the church with his guidelines for the qualifications of leaders and what happens when there's an accusation brought forward and all, a lot of other things too. You'll find this in the Holy Bible. And next, now we move into verse 21 with all this that we've already done. And you see here in 21, I'll let you read it yourself, that Paul exerts his apostolic authority. And the Holman commentary uh, uh, discussing verse 21 said this about verse 21. Quote, The temptation for many people, even those in leadership, is to avoid the uncomfortable especially when it involves disciplinary actions against a colleague, end quote. So this begs another question when we view this statement in the light of verse 21. And the question is this, who does the elder and the church represent to the world? If you are a follower of Christ and you go to a church, who do your spiritual leaders and who do you represent to the world? Who do you represent to the world? Notice also in verse 21, just sort of to understand that Paul brings to his case three witnesses. God, who's the judge of all, Jesus Christ, who will judge the, uh, will judge the world, and the elect angels who will carry out God's righteous judgments. 
I want to ask a couple more questions as we ponder all this. Uh, have you ever experienced or wondered when you consider the leadership of a church you may have belonged to or other churches that it sometimes seemed to come across like the leadership is like the old boys club? Maybe some questionable things occurred and it seems just maybe that that questionable thing has been brushed under the carpet. Maybe it's questionable, maybe it's not. You don't know. Let me ask another question. Is it possible that elders, that the elders, as Paul describes them, who directs the affairs of the church well, may they become, well, may they come under temptation and be tempted to be partial or show partiality or favoritism? Because, listen, understand, we all understand this, I think. Conflict and disciplinary action are never comfortable things, are they? Maybe if there's a charge against a brother or a sister, you know, in the Lord, it seems to you an impossibility. You say it can't be true. Friends, the challenge is always before each of us. Partiality and favoritism are found in everywhere in our culture. Just think about the small business or the business that lays off a long-time employee in favor of keeping a family member. They call that nepotism. We see this in politics, obviously. I don't have to say any more about that. Partiality and favoritism is abundant there. We see it in industry. We see it pretty much everywhere. And I just want to sort of be kind of clear. There's a different, we have to different, uh, we have to see something here that's, there's some tension here. I don't even know what I'm saying there. All this marbles in my mouth. Pardon me. You know, doing a favor for someone is not necessarily a bad thing. But friends, if the favor is at the expense of another or the expense of, you know, uh, important things, or even in order to hide an indiscretion or criminal activity, well, then it's something altogether different, is it not? So back to that question. Who does the elder and the church represent to the world? Sunday school answer, folks, Christ, Jesus Christ. We represent Christ in the world. When we go out there and the things that we do and how we act and how we think and how we deal with the business and the church when it comes to disciplinary actions, all reflect on Christ, our Lord and Savior. That's the way it works in any organization, if you think about it. But this is even one step beyond all that. We must not compromise our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We must act accordingly. We must, I believe, with all sincerity, uh, follow the commandments of God's Bible. James said this to those he wrote to in his letter. My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, must not show favoritism. He also went on to say in the same chapter 2, If you keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. Paul, in his amazing letter to the church in Rome, said this in the second chapter. You can check it out yourself. God will repay, repay each person according to what they have done. For God does not show favoritism. Well, this brings us to verse 22, which is completely connected to all this, if you, pay you, know, if you notice it. Do not be hasty in laying on the ha on of hands, and do not share in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. Throughout Paul's letter, he is presenting this attitude of keeping an attitude of untarnished, if you want to call it that, Chris, Christian wish, witness to be, be a, live a godly life to, before the brothers and sisters and the world around us. That is a perfect life, but a godly life, pursuing the things of God. And how does he maintain this sort of Attitude. Well, simply, and not too complicated here, folks, by sound biblical teaching and living holy. Living holy. That's different than being perfect, because none of us is perfect. Check it out for yourself in the scriptures, in the Bible. Remember that the, the, the church in Ephesus was dealing with false teachers. And this was important that uh, Timothy reestablish godly worship. And part of that is the leaders of that church. 
But as you know, and I know people are people, as the saying goes, necessity is the mother invention of invention. And sometimes the need to fill a position of elder or spiritual leader in the church or, or the potential of recruiting someone that is uh, very admired or popular maybe in, in Christian circles and in the denomination. And when we overlook their inconsistencies when we, we, we want to fill that warm seat, if you will, we overlook them and put them to the side and what may seem to be a small uh, thing will become a large problem down line. Paul pulls no punches here. And to let me uh, paraphrase rather pur purely, he, Paul is telling Timothy, Timothy, slow down, choose wisely and biblically. Don't become an accomplice, accomplice in someone else's sin. Well, we've arrived now in chapter uh, verse 23 to 25. Uh, time's not on our side, so we, we were not even going to deal with at verse 23, though it is part of this text. We'll, we'll have to address it another time, possibly. So keeping in mind the context, Paul here instructing Timothy in regards to the elders of the church, we also find a broader view. We find a biblical principle at work in the scripture here, in, the, in this text. So again, we think biblically, we go again to the Old Testament, and we're going to go to look at the book of Hosea briefly. And Hosea, the prophet, uh, speaking the words of God to Israel, said this, Sow for yourselves righteousness, reap the fruit of unfailing love, for it's time to seek the Lord. Then Hosea said about Israel, or God speaking through Hosea to Israel said, But you have planted wickedness, you have reaped evil. Paul in his letter to the Galatians said this, do not be deceived, God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please the flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the spirit, from the spirit will reap eternal life. And Paul said this to Timothy in verse 24, the sins of some are obvious, the sins of others trail behind them. And one commentator kind of puts it nicely for us, whether sins are obvious or unseen, they do bear fruit. So this is really important for us to consider as we represent Christ in the church, but in our community, into the world. Um, when we are picking and choosing our leaders, we do so according to the instructions and guidelines that we have in the scriptures. And when we're dealing with those who have been accused of something, we do that in the same manner. But to end on a really a more positive note, uh, it, it we see also here in verse 25 that Paul also said, in the same way good deeds are obvious, and even those that are not obvious cannot remain hidden. Remember what Jesus said, what comes out of our heart uh, is what comes out of our heart. It either defiles us or it will show that true godliness, if we are pursuing that as followers of Christ, cannot be kept a secret. We don't boast about it. We don't have to. Because true, God, pardon me, true godliness, well, as Hosea said, reap the fruit of unfailing love. Now, what we have here as I close is this whole picture of how to handle and how to deal with elders in the church and the responsibility of the church as a whole toward each other. And, and instead of making a bunch of different points to close off, I do want to say that, you know, to be a leader in pretty well most organizations, it's not really uh, the faint, for, uh, uh, faint of heart. I'm thinking specifically also in the church, and I want to close with a quote by Pastor Chuck Swindoll referencing leaders in a church. Leaders, he said, need to cultivate two things, a righteous heart and a rhinoceros skin. So thank you so much, and let's close in prayer. Uh, Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your, for your Holy Spirit, which has guided us through this whole time. And now, Lord, as I, I pray for those who are listening and watching, I pray, God, you would bless them 
and that we would, uh, together as a community of followers of Christ, would uh, do the, the things that bring you great honor and pleasure. And, and Lord, that we do have a message of hope, and it is in the gospel of Jesus Christ. We thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks again for uh, allowing me to be part of your day or your moment here. And as I mentioned earlier, please, if you have any questions, if you have any comments, you could leave it in, leave it in, uh, in a message format on Messenger, and uh, I'll be sure to get back to you on that as soon as possible. So thank you very much. God bless. Shalom.